In this lecture, uh, we're going to discuss a very interesting many-body quantum effect, uh, namely the phenomenon of superconductivity, uh, which is a rather amazing field because superconductors uh, have a, a number of remarkable properties, such as, for instance, uh, so shown here the phenomenon of uh, levitation. So you, here we, I'm showing uh, a high temperature superconductor wrapped up in a tissue to avoid heating, levitating uh, on top of a magnet. So, and this phenomenon is actually unique in this form to a uh, superconductor and it's based on expulsion of magnetic flux, so Meissner effect. So uh, here I'm actually showing you uh, a movie of the same effect, uh, which uh, was uh, recorded by my experimental colleague, Jean Pierre Paglione in the Joint Quantum Institute. So and you see, here you see a superconductor moving around uh, on top of a magnet. So this phenomenon of levitation uh, is uh, indeed well quite remarkable and it's oftentimes used to impress uh, visitors at uh, various science shows, uh, but it's just one of many uh, exciting uh, uh, phenomena that appear uh, in relation to superconductivity and some of them we're going to discuss uh, later today. But um, uh, let me just mention that superconductivity is an extremely rich field, so uh, suffices uh, to say that it has so far resulted in about 10 Nobel Prizes that have been awarded for various discoveries in superconductivity and uh, furthermore there are definitely a lot of uh, major mysteries that still remain in the field and uh, obviously we cannot discuss everything in one lecture so uh, I'm going to focus towards the end of the lecture uh, on a key uh, theoretical concept that uh, sort of underlies the theory uh, so-called bargain cooper schiffer theory of superconductivity and this is the phenomenon of uh, Cooper pairing which is responsible for, uh, to, to a large degree, uh, for the appearance of the effect. But let me start with uh, discussing uh, the main property uh, of a uh, superconductor, namely uh, the state of uh, zero resistance, which is also a reason why superconductors are actually called superconductors. And um, uh, to do so, let me go uh, back in time about 100, uh, a little more than 100 years ago to 1911, when this uh, happy-looking guy, Heike Kamerlingonis, uh, was uh, performing uh, various uh, low-temperature experiments uh, to liquefy helium, and during these experiments uh, he noticed that the resistivity of mercury dropped exactly to zero below a certain critical temperature of 4.2 Kelvin. So this was very surprising, and actually it is very surprising, it also should surprise you, in particular if you recall what we discussed um, in the fourth lecture, in the last lecture last week, uh, where we talked about the uh, resistivity of metals. And so uh, I mentioned that in all real materials, there are always are imperfections that uh, give rise to uh, disorder, that in turn give rise uh, to scattering and finite resistance. So what you would expect in a normal metal uh, would be that the resistance can, well, it can go um, down, but you would want it to saturate to a certain finite value. If there is no localization, if there is localization, it actually would shoot up and go to infinity. But there is no sort of a reasonable um, sort of a priori reason why it would drop down to exactly zero. Not to a small value, not to a tiny value, to exactly zero. And this is what Kamerlingh observed, and this was the birth of, super, of superconductivity. It was the first time people saw superconductivity and uh, it was truly amazing effect and it, uh, in particular uh, because of that he was awarded uh, the 1913 uh, Nobel Prize in Physics. Now um, another effect which already discussed in the relation to this levitation was uh, magnetic uh, flux expulsion. This is probably a second very interesting uh, phenomenon and uh, well if you uh, if you have a metal uh, uh, let's say if you heat up this material uh, uh, up to room temperature let's say and uh, penetrate it with magnetic flux the flux will more or less just go through the material above the critical temperature and uh, there will be no uh, significant distortion of the flux so a sort of amazing uh, phenomenon that happens once you go into the superconducting phase is that the magnetic field uh, now tries to avoid the superconductor so, and instead of going through it, it goes around it. And so you may say that it's expelled from the superconductor and this uh, effect is called the Meissner effect. 
So returning to this uh, picture of a high temperature superconductor levitating on, on top of a magnet, what's actually going on here is that the magnetic field lines are sort of go around, primarily go around this superconductor. And uh, you may say that uh, this superconductor sort of is sitting on this, uh, on this flux because it's energetically not favorable for it to go down. It would increase the energy of the system and uh, therefore it's supported by this flux. Well, just a short comment here though is that I'm a bit oversimplifying this picture. Uh, so as a matter of fact, there is, uh, there is indeed this Meissner effect, but uh, apart from the Meissner effect, there is also a little bit of a penetration of the superconductor by a magnetic field, but this penetration happens in the form of so-called vortices, which are, uh, if you look at the, let's say, if you look at the uh, cross-section of the superconductor, two-dimensional cross-section and uh, so I, let me just uh, plot it here so there will be the superconductor and most of this uh, cross-section is magnetic field uh, free but there are certain regions which are very uh, narrow regions very small regions where you do have a magnetic field sort of penetrating through uh, very thin lines and these lines are called vortices so in superconductor, these uh, magnetic field lines are called vortices. And these vortices are, um, tend to appear in the regions where superconductivity is suppressed due to various kinds of imperfections, a disorder that we already discussed. And uh, this in turn uh, leads to the pinning of this magnetic field line. So as a matter of fact, if you perform this experiment with a true so-called type two superconductor, which allows these uh, flux, flux lines, you not only would be able to see that it can be levitating on top of a magnet, you can actually turn it any way you see fit. You can turn it at any angle and it's still gonna sort of retain its position. And this uh, actually even more impressive uh, phenomenon is due to these uh, flux lines and the spinning. But uh, you know, to discuss it further would be a bit uh, going too far. So let me just stop here and say that uh, all in all, so this uh, magnetic field um, expulsion is responsible for this uh, phenomenon of levitation. On a, on a different note, interestingly, the Meissner effect, this expulsion of the magnetic flux, on the theoretical side uh, is to some degree equivalent to the uh, Higgs mechanism that occurs in uh, elementary particle physics. I'm sure many of you have heard about the discovery of so-called the God particle or Higgs particle uh, last year, but actually the mathematical theory of this uh, Higgs uh, mechanism in a different context of condensed matter physics was put together actually before Higgs uh, by Phil Anderson. And strictly speaking, I would actually call it Anderson Higgs mechanism. I'm not going to go into details of why this expulsion of uh, magnetic flux is equivalent to Higgs, but you may have heard that Higgs um, uh, really is important in elementary particle physics because it gives rise because it gives rise to masses for some elementary particles. Here you may say that the Higgs mechanism in this form gives rise to a mass of the magnetic field, so it becomes um, energetically unfavorable for the magnetic field to be inside the superconductor. And uh, well, this uh, energy, this energy penalty for it to be there is sort of proportional to the so-called superconducting order parameter that uh, appears below the critical temperature. So I already advertised the fact that superconductors host an amazing variety of various uh, new phenomena and uh, the discoveries of, of these phenomena have in turn led to uh, at least 10 Nobel Prizes and I list here these uh, major discoveries, sort of hallmark discoveries in the field. And the first one we already uh, talked about, this is the Kamalingana's discovery of the effect itself back in 1911. Then uh, John Bardeen, Leon Cooper and uh, Bob Schiffer uh, got a 1972 Nobel Prize for developing a microscopic theory of superconductivity in the 50s. Uh, Brian Josephson uh, and uh, Ivar Jeber uh, got the 1973 Nobel Prize for discovering tunneling phenomena, various interesting tunneling effects in superconductors, in particular uh, quantum coherent Josephson effect, so-called Josephson effect. We're not going to be talking about it, but it's very interesting. So these guys um, um, made a major breakthrough in the field. I'm going to mention it in the next slide uh, by discovering um, so-called the family of uh, high temperature uh, cooperate superconductors. Um, and um, uh, finally, just uh, 10 years ago, Alex Abrikosov and Vitaly Ginsburg 
along with uh, Tony Leggett, um, got um, a Nobel Prize. Uh, and in particular, these two gentlemen uh, have uh, uh, put together a theory of vortices, uh, topological excitations that appear uh, in uh, these uh, quantum fluids. And I'm also including here a future Nobel Prize, which uh, almost guaranteed to um, be awarded sometime in the future for a theory of this high temperature superconductor that I just mentioned. We don't really know yet uh, the nature of these guys. We know they exist, we know a lot of their properties, very unusual properties, but what's really going on there, we don't know. So maybe it's going to be you, who knows. But you should um, hurry because uh, I think the new experiments are getting us closer and closer uh, to the uh, to understanding the sort of uncovering the mystery of these uh, high temperature cooperas. In any case, uh, I want to, what I want to uh, emphasize here on this slide is a very large time gap between the discovery uh, and the corresponding prize for uh, of the first superconductor and the microscopic theory of superconductivity, which put, was put together. Uh, about uh, 40, 50 years later, and it's not for uh, a lack of trying. People uh, had tried very hard and couldn't succeed, so it turned out to be very difficult to explain the basic uh, nature of superconductors. Even though it took a while for the theorists uh, to uh, have provide an explanation of superconductivity, the experimental work on this effect has never really stopped uh, since 1911, since the discovery uh, by Carmel Ganes. And the motivation for these experiments is really easy to understand. So as I mentioned, of course, uh, superconductors uh, are special in that they have exactly zero resistance. So they have no losses whatsoever. And they are able to conduct electricity with no uh, heating. So if uh, we were able to have a superconductor at room temperature, such a room temperature superconducting wires would have been able uh, to transport electricity over large distances with, with no losses. And this, of course, would have been great, especially now in uh, the uh, view of this looming uh, energy crisis. Of course, now we uh, transport electricity from where we produce it to where we use it using, well, normal wires, metallic wires, and uh, those involve finite resistance and heating. And so this heat we just lose, so this goes nowhere. So uh, to have a room temperature superconductor would be really great. And, uh, but unfortunately, at this stage, we don't really know whether uh, a, such uh, a material may exist, whether it's possible at all. But um, uh, there has been a lot of progress growing materials which have a much higher transition temperatures than uh, the first uh, 4.2 uh, Kelvin superconductor uh, back here. So this is the discovery of superconductivity. And this plot here uh, is really a diagram. So here's the year uh, from uh, the early 1900s up to almost now. And the uh, points here are uh, the uh, correspond to compounds with various transition temperatures. And so you see that for the first, uh, let's say 70 or so years, uh, the progress has been really slow. But then in, uh, in the 80s, there is a huge jump up to here, and this class of materials are uh, what I already mentioned, the uh, high temperature superconductors, so-called cuprate superconductors, which are getting, which is somehow dangerously in quotes, close to room temperature, but we're not, they're not there yet. So they're close, but you know, we still have about 100 uh, Kelvin to go. Now, and also uh, very recently, there was a discovery of a new class of uh, materials, so-called uh, iron-based uh, superconductors or nick ties, that also look promising. Uh, but so far, uh, all in all, this race to increase the transition temperatures in superconductors uh, hasn't really involved much theories, mostly about uh, experimental magic uh, of uh, growing uh, materials and uh, trying out different compounds. Um, to emphasize this fact, let me actually, um, in the last slide, in this segment, let me actually mention a um, um, guy uh, who was really, really good at finding new superconductors. He was an experimentalist working uh, at Bell Labs. Uh, his name was Bernd uh, Matthias, uh, and uh, he was a legend uh, in, uh, in this business. And uh, he, back in the 50s uh, and 60s, he came up with a set of rules uh, to help others uh, discover new superconductors. And here I just list those rules. I don't expect you to understand uh, their significance. It actually, they're not 
to be taken too, too seriously because in these high temperature superconductors most of these rules actually violate it. But let me uh, go over them. So uh, he said that high symmetry is good, cubic symmetry is best, one should stay away from oxygen, stay away from magnetism, stay away from insulators. By the way, this is all we find in high temperature superconductors. And the, impose, the most important rule due to Matthias was uh, to stay away from theories. And uh, this was really um, um, uh, bad, you know, because, uh, but it was deserved because, uh, again, for many years uh, there was no theory of superconductivity. But fortunately, uh, the situation has changed uh, in uh, the 1950s when uh, Leon Cooper uh, and then uh, John Bardeen and Bob Schiffer came up with a, a very clear explanation of the effect. And in the remaining three segments, we're going to go over this explanation, but um, in the next video, I'm going to mostly uh, talk about the preliminary material that we need to know to get there.